What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Welcome back, all my friends and internet listeners. It's great to be with you again. This is the 12th week of the Illumination Hour. So you can email me at illuminationhour at gmail.com. Especially if you have suggestions about how I can improve the show, topics you want me to cover, things like that. This week, I'm going to be talking about the information age, what that is, and how it came about. How does it influence our everyday lives? Maybe it does more than we realize, and it's not entirely our fault. Perhaps there's some sort of historical aspect we can take into account when thinking about how information and technology has shaped our existence, but we don't always have time to do that, especially when we're just living out our daily lives and we're surrounded by this. It's it's normalized for us, so we don't really take into account how it may be changing the way we interact and exist. So I'm going to read a little bit about the information age, and then we'll discuss it. The information age, also known as the computer age, digital age, or new media age, is this period in human history characterized by the shift from traditional industries, such as uh, industry that the Industrial Revolution brought into play through industrialization, So a shift from that to an economy based on information computerization. So as some of you know, there are several stages of civilization when it comes to development and how people interact not only with each other, but also with the world around them. People begin as hunter-gatherers. Eventually they evolve into pastoral horticultural communities. They go from agrarian to industrial, where now they're creating machinery and large factories, and then eventually the post-industrial, which is kind of what we have today, where we're beyond the dirty, messy, loud, and especially expensive development of the industrialized world, and now we've moved on to something that's more clean-cut and sanitized and a little bit less focused on manual labor and more so focused on keeping relationships close and developing newer technologies. So that last part I mentioned, to an economy based on information computerization. What does that mean, computerization? That means that the economy is mostly based on computer systems or information stored within a system of computers. The onset of the information age is also associated with the digital revolution, similar to how the industrial revolution marked the onset of the industrial age. So if the digital revolution is so important to the information age, what exactly is that? How can we define that? Here I'm referencing an article from techopedia.com on what digital revolution actually means in real terms. So we can think of the digital revolution as the advancement of technology from analog, electronic, and mechanical devices to the digital technology available today. This era started in the 1980s and is still going on. The development and advancement of digital technologies started with one fundamental idea, the Internet. Here's a brief timeline of how the digital revolution progressed. From 1947 to 1979, the transistor, which was introduced in 1947, paved the path for the development of advanced digital computers. The government, military, and other organizations that were highly organized and had access to loads of money made use of computer systems during the 50s and 60s, back when they were these giant machines that took up entire rooms. 
This research eventually led to the creation of the World Wide Web. In the 1980s, the computer became a familiar machine, and by the end of the decade, being able to use one became a necessity for many jobs. So it's becoming more widespread, more introduced to the population, and people are realizing this thing has real potential, and it already has great capability to make their business or their lives run much smoother. So it became more essential for people to use computers, and on top of that. The first cell phones were also introduced during the 80s, so now we're having smaller personal devices that are just immensely convenient. People are really starting to want these things. By 1992, the World Wide Web had been introduced, and by 1996, the internet became a normal part of most business operations. By the late 90s. The internet became a part of everyday life for almost half of the American population. This is an advancement at a crazy speed. In only two years' time, the World Wide Web was introduced, and then people started buying computers and using them left and right. So much so that fifty percent of the U.S. population had access to them on a regular basis. By the 2000s, the digital revolution had begun to spread all over the developing world. Mobile phones were commonly seen. The number of internet users continued to grow, and the television started to transition from using analog to digital sound. As far as 2010 and beyond goes, more than 25 percent of the world's population has access to internet on a regular basis. Mobile communications have also become extremely important, as almost seventy percent of the world's population owns a mobile phone. The connection between internet websites and mobile gadgets has become a standard in communication. It's predicted that soon the innovation of tablet computers will far surpass personal computers, with the use of internet and the promise of cloud computing services. This will allow users to consume media and use business applications on their mobile devices, applications that would otherwise be too much for such devices to handle. So we certainly have a lot to look forward to in the digital revolution, but we also have a lot of history to look back on. I mean, just seeing how transistors made their way up to becoming computers with the World Wide Web and cell phones and cloud computing services. These are all amazing discoveries, and it all happened in less than seventy years. It's pretty amazing to live with, especially now that things are advancing at a more increased rate. So now that we know how the digital revolution is tied to the information age, let's go a little bit further. So during the information age, the phenomena is that the digital industry creates a knowledge-based society, and this knowledge-based society. Is surrounded by a high-tech global economy that spans over its influence on how the manufacturing throughput and the service sector operate in an efficient and convenient way. So, how is it exactly that the digital industry creates a knowledge-based society? Well, maybe if we explore the idea of a knowledge-based society a little bit more, we'll understand how that connection has been forged. Here I'm going to be referencing a page from PragueFoundation.net on the concept of what is a knowledge society. The emergence of the knowledge society, building on the pervasive influence of modern information and communication technologies, is bringing about a fundamental reshaping of the global economy. Its significance goes well beyond the hyping of the internet. What is underway is a transformation of our economy and society. Knowledge has always been a factor of production. After all, you can't make things without knowing how to make them. It's also been a driver of economic and social development. After all, those who know the most usually can create the best ideas. Earlier economies depended, for example, on knowledge about how to farm. How to build or how to manufacture. However, the capacity to manipulate, store, and transmit large quantities of information cheaply has increased at a staggering rate. 
over recent years. The digitalization of information and the associated pervasiveness of the internet are facilitating a new intensity in the application of knowledge to economic activity to the extent that it has become the predominant factor in the creation of wealth. As much as 70 to 80 percent of economic growth is now said to be due to a new and better knowledge. Information and communication technologies are also facilitating a rapid globalization of economic activities. In an increasingly global economy, where knowledge about how to excel competitively and information about who excels are both more readily available, use and dissemination of knowledge is increasingly the key to success, and thus to sustainable economic and social development that benefits everyone. Innovation, which fuels new job creation and economic growth, is quickly becoming the key factor in global competitiveness. Innovation fundamentally means coming up with new ideas about how to do things better or faster. It's about making a product or offering a service that no one has thought of before. It's also about putting new ideas together or to work in enterprise and having a skilled workforce that can actually utilize those new ideas. It's a further feature of the knowledge economy that it increasingly relies on the diffusion and use of information and knowledge, as well as its creation. The success of enterprises and national economies becomes increasingly dependent on the information infrastructure that is necessary for the gathering and utilization of knowledge. The importance of broadband telecommunications infrastructure in this context must be recognized as no less significant than the importance of electricity to 20th century industrial development. Knowledge has become the key resource. Knowledge has value, but so too does knowledge about knowledge. Creating value is about creating new knowledge and capturing its value. The most important property is now intellectual property, not physical property. And it is the heart and minds of people, rather than traditional labor, that are essential to growth and prosperity. Workers at all levels in this 21st century knowledge society will need to be lifelong learners, adapting continuously to changed opportunities, work practices, business models, and forms of economic and social organizations. Now, earlier when I said intellectual properties, there, I don't mean uh, like copyright and things that you can threaten to sue people over if they use. I'm not saying that I, I like the laws around intellectual property. I was just saying the most important property is intellectual property, as in ideas, creations, things that are not actually physical. And they are important, but they're also infinitely reproducible. So once you put it out there, people will reward you for that. But that doesn't mean that from that point on you can own it and control it. Once an idea gets out, it spreads through people's minds like wildfire. You can't stop that. It's natural. It's going to happen. You can't own ideas. But you can create them. Now, obviously, it's different with trade secrets and things like that, because those are just ideas that are kept secret. But what do they say about knowledge? They say knowledge is power, and it couldn't be any more true. Knowledge is power. With knowledge, you can do anything you want to. You can learn to be an engineer or a biologist or an economist. You could learn to do anything you want. You can learn to build anything you want. You can become anything with knowledge. And with that knowledge, if you spread it to other people around you, everyone else becomes an expert as well. And then you can all work together and develop new ideas off of the ones that you developed previously. The age we're in now, just as in pretty much all previous ages, we are standing on the shoulders of all the knowledge of the people that have discovered things and have been built up over the years. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, of discoverers, of people who pioneered eras, who pioneered sciences, and studies. 
Knowledge is what has allowed us to develop things like electronics and lights and factories. It's what has allowed us to discover cures for diseases that we used to think were incurable. With knowledge, of course, comes great responsibility. Some knowledge we have a responsibility to share for the good of everyone around us. Some knowledge we can keep to ourselves. The point is, though, knowledge is what allows us to develop and grow. And not just in one area or a few specific ones, but in every single area. Anyway, now we know what a knowledge society is and why it is crucial that we all take part in this digital revolution of our knowledge-based society. So the information age has brought about this knowledge-based society by providing us with the means by which we can find any information that we want, basically at the click of a button. And that has vastly changed how manufacturing and service sectors operate in a meaningful way with the rest of the world. In a commercialized society such as our own, the information industry is able to allow individuals to explore their personalized needs, therefore simplifying the process of making decisions for transactions and significantly lowering costs for both the producers and buyers. Well, hang on a minute there. It doesn't seem like that's completely true. Yes, the information industry allows individuals to explore their personalized needs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it makes decisions any easier. I mean, after all, it's much harder to make a decision if you're presented with too many options as opposed to too few. It is true, however, that it lowers cost for both producers and buyers. It's a lot more affordable for companies to test out and try three or four different styles of clothing, for example, that they know through their studies people enjoy certain aspects of it. But if the company was going in blindly just trying to sell things to people in mass and they had pretty much no idea of what it was that people were buying the most of, then that would take a lot more trial and error and failed attempts. But I want to discuss this idea a little bit more about how the information industry is feeding into commercialization and how they kind of use each other back and forth, how they build on to each other. I'm going to be referencing an article here from HBR.org about knowing what your customers want before they do. Shoppers, once upon a time, relied on a familiar salesperson, such as the proprietor of their neighborhood general store, to help them find just what they wanted. Drawing on what he knew or could quickly deduce about the customer, he would locate the perfect product and often suggest additional items the customer hadn't even thought of. It's a quaint scenario. Today's distracted consumers, bombarded with information and options online, like, look at all these Google ads. I'm already, I'm looking at two right now on my computer screen. You can't escape ads anymore. We're all bombarded with all this useless information. And sometimes, because of that, people often struggle to find the products or services that will best meet their needs. The shorthanded and often poorly informed floor staff at most retailing sites can't begin to replicate the personal touch that shoppers once depended on, and consumers are still largely on their own when they shop online. There's not someone there helping you around, asking you questions. Luckily, or not so luckily, this sorry state of affairs is changing. Advances in information technology data gathering, and analytics are making it possible to deliver something like, or perhaps even better than, the proprietor's advice. Using increasingly granular data, from detailed demographics and psychographics to consumers' click streams on the web, businesses are starting to create highly customized offers that steer consumers to the right merchandise or services, at the right moment, at the right price and in the right channel. These are called next best offers. Consider Microsoft's success with 
email offers for its search engine Bing. Those emails are tailored to the recipient at the moment they're opened. In 200 milliseconds, a lag imperceptible to the recipient. Advanced analytics software assembles an offer based on real-time information about him or her. Data including location, age, gender, and online activity, both historical and immediately preceding. Now think about that. They're looking at everything that you've clicked on in your web browser, along with the most recent responses of other customers. It's a little creepy, but these ads have lifted conversation rates by as much as 70%, dramatically more than similar but uncustomized marketing efforts. The technologies and strategies for crafting next best offers are evolving, but businesses that wait to exploit them will see their customers defect to competitors that take the lead. Microsoft is just one example. Other companies, too, are revealing the business potential of well-crafted NBOs. NBOs being next best offers. But on our research on NBO strategies in dozens of retail, software, financial services, and other companies, which included interviews with executives at 15 firms in the Vanguard, we found that if NBOs are done at all, they're often done poorly. Most are indiscriminate or ill-targeted. Pitches to customers who have already bought the offering, for example. I get this one all the time. I look up something on Amazon and then suddenly I've got 500 ads on my computer. Every page I go to, buy this, buy that, I've already bought it. Or maybe I was just looking at it, I don't need that. Either way, it's super fucking creepy and weird that you have all of this information and are bombarding me with my own past. Okay, I don't need you to tell me what my search history was. And I don't even know why you have that information in the first place. Oh, here's a good allegory. One retail bank discovered that its NBOs were more likely to create ill will than to increase sales. Yes, because it's frustrating. Companies can pursue great goals using consumer analytics, but next best offer programs provide perhaps the greatest value in terms of enhanced competitiveness. Sometimes when I buy something online, I'll look at the next best offers and maybe they're useful, maybe there's something for me to compare there, but most of the time they're just annoying and they really are all pervasive. You can never escape them unless you have some sort of ad blocking software or perhaps a web browser that is not keeping track of your search history. Which even then, sometimes, that's questionable. So how do companies know what their customers want before they do? Well, it's all of this information that they collect. From everyone that uses the internet. All of their search histories. They gather this data in mass. And they form these charts and sheets. And they, they can figure out trends based off of that. Now, is that information that you voluntarily gave? That's questionable. No, you didn't sign an agreement saying that they could use it, but then again, you were using the internet unprotected. So companies have gotten really good at collecting this sort of information and putting it all together. And now it's so much easier to do, especially when you can store so much information on a small, small space or in the cloud. So now that people have all of this information openly available to them, they can search for the cheapest or the best options, and in that way, they can manipulate the market to something that meets the approvals of the buyers, and the producers can respond to that much easier and faster. This sort of society, this sort of information industry influence is accepted overwhelmingly by participants throughout the entire economic activities for it being so effective at achieving its goal and also for new economic incentives that would then be encouraged, such as the knowledge economy. Oh yes, people over the past several decades have welcomed with open arms the information revolution. It's a really well-oiled machine at this point. People go online, they shop around, they look at things, the data is gathered, that data is sent to the companies, the companies analyze it and create items based off of that, and then it turns into a cycle of information gathering and information giving.
But something I've been watching and noticing and wondering about, even since I was young, has to do with how this information revolution is changing our lives in a sociological way. How is it affecting the way that we interact with other people, or how we network? Well, we know that the information technology has led to awareness, prosperity, freedom, a good opportunity to learn and understand, and an even better opportunity to live, to learn, to make a living. But it also has its challenges. Oftentimes, we find ourselves bombarded by false or manipulated information. Sometimes that affects a lot. Development of technological tools can provide the breeding grounds for new subcultures. The way people communicate is even different based on how we interact over the web or through our cell phones. Understanding our society is not possible without knowing about our technological tools. This ever-expanding information technology has effects deep within us. It changes our lifestyle, our thinking, our communication, and our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. Our society is one of information and open access. Being able to access and use that knowledge, it's a central and decisive role. Societies without the culture of information can't reach a high level of economic and technological achievement. So since we're talking about information and technology, we might as well discuss the concept of networks. Networks are composed from a set of connection points, or interconnected nodes. To explain a connection point, we can reference something like a political network, say, the Union of Europe. It has connection points such as the National Council of Ministers and senior European officials. Or in the global financial network, the connection points are stock markets and their service centers. Social networks are not actual networks, of course. <laughs> They're a type of social structure, which is composed of individuals or groups of individuals. Their relationships are generally friendship, kinship, supportive, transactional, emotional, or cognitive. This structure can potentially have centralized management, or it can be without any management at all. Total anarchy! Each network is composed of a number of connection points, or nodes, similar to nerve synapses that the information flows through. Control is exercised through these nodes, usually. Each independent person can take information, process it, and give off information depending on how they processed it. Social networks are open structures which can spread without any restrictions and can be receptive to new nodes as long as they have the ability to communicate. The way that we form networks and interact with them has been completely and utterly altered since the invention of the internet and text messaging. Now we can communicate with anyone, anywhere, anytime, even through the veil of anonymity if we so choose. There are various different kinds of social networks. There are emotional, social, and unified networks. An emotional support network includes people who have a very close relationship with each other. The purpose of this network is mostly emotional protection of the individuals in that group. So basically just a group of people that are there to make you feel better. We all have them. We all have friends and we talk to our friends and our friends are supportive and positive and that's why we have them around. Our social support network is larger than the network of emotional protection. Emotional needs are not usually all that important in this network. The social support network is composed of individuals who are there for different reasons. They all have different interests and different goals. Social networks are more so about people that you have something in common with, but that could be more or less key to your friendship or your relationship. Unified networks include individuals who recognize them. Most people in these types of networks have 
no specific task except as an information carrier. Usually it's just people that you're acquainted with that you know, that you can recognize and perhaps have a short conversation with. Among them can be mentioned the network, which can provide information about employment opportunities, such as LinkedIn or Facebook. There is an extra sort of network called community-based, which is a kind of social network which today is created with the goal of community empowerment. Through it, individuals or a group of people with participation and utilization of existing resources and capacities are then able to monitor, evaluate, and assess different scenarios, which eventually leads to change based on insights and individual capacity or teamwork. Unfortunately today, this sort of network is often used in combat, as it's related to social pathology. The shape of a social network helped determine a network's usefulness to its individuals. Smaller, tighter networks can be less useful to their members than networks with lots of loose connections to individuals outside the main network. More open networks with many weak ties and social connections are more likely to introduce new ideas and opportunities to their members than close, tightly knit ones with many redundant ties. In other words, a group of friends who only do things with each other already share the same knowledge and opportunities. A group of individuals with connections to other social worlds is likely to have access to a wider range of information. It's better for individual success to have connections with a variety of networks rather than many connections within a single network. Similarly, individuals can exercise influence or act as brokers within their social networks by bridging to networks that are not directly linked. This is called filling structural holes. Social capital in social networks depends on your number of connections. So the more connections, the more participation you have in these social networks, the more social capital you can gain. This is what popularity is. Although it sounds like I'm kind of mocking the idea here, I think it's there is actually some truth to it, and perhaps we could all use a little bit more variety in our social lives. Now that we know basically what these networks are, we can understand a little bit better how they're affected with informational technology and little gadgets like computers or cell phones. Accessing anybody you want to talk to is as simple as looking up their name. There are countless social media platforms that you can engage in and get to know total strangers. There are millions of people literally out there waiting to meet someone new. You can introduce yourself to someone who lives in Russia or California. It doesn't matter. Anywhere on the globe where there's internet access, you can talk to someone. And that is incredible. But there's also this overflow of information that is just so distracting. Oftentimes, people can't focus for very long without looking at Instagram or checking their text messages. Having a conversation is growing increasingly more difficult, I've found. As we shorten words and sentences, we also shorten our trains of thoughts. How meaningful are our connections with other people? Do we even have deep connections with people now? Or is it just hellos and goodbyes and haha, lol, no wait, really? OMG, wow, Rothel. I'm really kind of annoyed by it. It seems like people are going through a stage of unlearning where at one point they cared about grammar and communication and now it seems more about just saying I'm here pay attention to me so we have this really strange dichotomy going on on one hand we have all of this information all of this knowledge that is supposed to benefit our lives and on the other hand we have total communication with everyone everywhere and we feel differently about it because there's this anonymity and there's this lack of value inherent in it because how much are you going to value something if you just have an infinite amount of it? 
Most people's brains can't really comprehend the number of people who use the internet. It's so, it's in the billions. We don't even know how to fully comprehend that number, and yet we interact with that many people every time we go online in one way or another. And also, we have this language, this way of doing things that just gets faster and faster, shorter and shorter, and it's really affecting how we look at other people, how we analyze situations, and how we talk to people. I mean, are we more engaged in forming a real connection with someone, or are we more engaged in just getting some sort of glorification or acknowledgement? We all know by now that the internet is a breeding ground for silly things like cat memes and dubbed music videos, but it's also a breeding ground for ideas. So maybe the internet culture that has emerged from this information age isn't a total bad thing at all. I mean, yes, it's a little bit annoying, but at the same time, it's just a byproduct of all of this information and knowledge and creativity pooled into one place. Now, there certainly are people who talk a lot on the internet. They seem to spend all day on there, which is one of those side effects of having the internet available all the time, everywhere. And perhaps I could stand them more if they explained their ideas or their opinions in a more eloquent way. But most online commentators, they cut their sentences down to something that'll fit into a tweet. Or they respond with emotion and slang, things to get people to respond. These are known as internet trolls. Some internet commentators even will leave a, an explanation for what they're saying, but often it's tied to some sort of logical fallacy. And if that's the best you've got, then I'm sorry, but that is no foundation for an ideological revolution, my friend. Perhaps you can achieve some sort of effective communication that way, but there's certainly a lot to be desired in it. I'm not one of those people that is against new technology. I'm not afraid of the singularity, and I'm not afraid of my job being taken by a robot, because I know that, at least for now, I can be smarter than a robot. I love technology. Bring it on. And I'm certainly enjoying this knowledge-based society in which we live, where anytime I want to know something, anytime I feel curious, I can just type in a couple words and find thousands of results on just that topic, or maybe related ones. And it's amazing that so many companies and businesses are able to take advantage of the internet and use it to tailor their products to their consumers, to their buyers and their customers. I think it's made my life a lot better, and it's made millions of products around the world that much better just by getting that sort of consumer feedback and storing that information and having it available for reference. So all of this is great, it's dandy, it's wonderful, but the downfall that I see is in our own human psychology. When we're faced with millions of options, we have trouble picking even one. When there are millions of people out in the world, we scrutinize ourselves so as to present ourselves in a way that the rest of the world will find appealing. We're considering many more people than we normally would. Our social networks are crazily large, we can't even keep track of them. And it's turning a lot of people into narcissists. I mean, there are some people I know that are famous in my mind just for taking selfies. Or sometimes it seems like they make comments online about things that are somewhat obvious or kind of ridiculous that make it seem like they just like the sound of their own voice or keyboard. And that's not even a rarity anymore. That just happens all the time. Also, because people are so willing to put out information about themselves on the internet, it's a lot easier to be taken advantage of by people who know how to collect that information. So we have a ways to go before we completely work out all the kinks with human internet interaction. 
I believe that there is a way we can use technology, such as the internet and the information age, to benefit our lives in a positive way. We just have to have the discipline to do it and to not get distracted by Instagram pictures of cute kitties. Although I really, really want to, I want to open up my phone and go to that app and scroll through Instagram. But you know, you don't need to. Instead, why don't you look up something that you've been wondering about? Why don't you connect with someone that you haven't talked to in a long time? Why don't you find something that you thought didn't exist? But now your mind has been blown because you finally realized that that invention you came up with, somebody's already made it, and made it even better than you imagined it would be. And if that's not the case, then why don't you invent something? All the information you could ever need is there online. I mean, there are a plethora of ways to use the internet and all of the technology around you in a positive way. Unfortunately, it's much easier to not use it in such a positive way, which is where my somewhat pessimistic outlook on the information age comes from. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that there are a portion of people who do the right thing, but there are also a portion of people who don't do the right thing. And when I say that, I mean they can be easily distracted online or even do things that are more malevolent, like take someone's information without their permission. But the great thing about the information era is that with all of this knowledge being freely spread across the globe, we can now learn about just about anything or anyone. Uh, we can find the information that's relevant and we can judge based on that. We have a lot more evidence to go on now because we have all of this knowledge and information. So it's basically the idea of people having access to information and being the judges of that. If more people judge something as good, then that idea will be spread. And if more people judge something as bad, then that ideal will most likely be subverted. Although we can't deny the fact that there are still bad ideas that exist, although I have no idea why. But the good thing about the information age is that people have the ability to learn about these sorts of things and make their own decisions based on that. We don't need to rely on experts anymore or on a single source of information. Fortunately, the information age will favor those that do the right thing. Although, the information age supposedly started a while ago. Is it still happening if our technology is increasing at an ever more rapid rate? Not according to Gizmodo, it's not. I have an article here titled, The Information Age is Over. Welcome to the Infrastructure Age. This article is written by Anna Lee Newitz. She says, Nobody wants to say it outright, but the Apple Watch sucks. So do most smartwatches. Every time I use my beautiful Moto 360, its lack of functionality makes me despair. But the problem isn't our gadgets. It's that the future of consumer tech isn't going to come from information devices. It's going to come from infrastructure. That's why Elon Musk's announcement of the new Tesla battery line were more revolutionary than Apple Watch and more exciting than Microsoft's admittedly nifty HoloLens. Information tech isn't dead. It's just matured to the point where all we'll get are better iterations of the same thing. Better cameras and apps for our phones, VR that actually works. But these are not revolutionary gadgets. They're just realizations of dreams that began in the 1980s when the information revolution transformed the consumer electronics market. But now we're entering the age of infrastructure gadgets. Thanks to devices like Tesla's household battery, power wall, electrical grid technology that was once hidden behind massive barbed wire fences owned by municipalities and counties is now seeping slowly into our homes. And it isn't just about alternative energy like solar. It's about how we conceive of what technology is. It's about what kind of gadgets we will be buying for ourselves in 20 years. It's about how the kids of tomorrow won't freak out over terabytes of storage. They'll freak out over kilowatt hours. 
All right, I have to make an interjection in this story. So, so far, the author has made a good point. The technology that we have now has really just been realizations of things that people have come up with and we've been wanting to have for a long time and now we finally have them. In the future, they're just going to be better and better. But the big problem I have so far in the story is about Tesla's power wall that she referenced. And I I just want to take a moment here and say that Elon Musk is not the savior that everyone thinks he is. Sure, he comes up with great ideas, but also he's largely funded by the government. So his inventions, supposedly, are not making a profit. They're not earning as much as everyone like would like to think. And they're not really that great either. They're not the answer to everything that we've been hoping for. In fact, the Powerwall would take close to 30 years to make up for the money that you'd be spending on it. So to save the money that you're spending on it, you'd have to use it for 30 years. And in the right way, you'd have to store the power on it at a a low cost time during the day and use it during high cost times of the day because energy costs different amounts depending on how much is being used throughout the day. Also, it's not completely efficient, although the efficiency is rated at about 92%, which is pretty good. But if it stores 7.5 kilowatt hours, it only provides about 6.5 kilowatt hours once fully charged. Even if you are using solar power to charge the power wall, taking into account the amount that you'd spend on the solar panels, it would still take about 30 years to pay off, three times the warranty period. So this may be the first step, but we still have quite a ways to go as far as energy storage and usage. Okay, now back to the story. Beyond transforming our relationship to energy, though, The infrastructure age is about where we expect computers to live. The so-called Internet of Things is a big part of things. Our computers aren't living in isolated boxes on our desktops, and they aren't going to be inside our phones either. The apps in your phone won't always suck you into virtual worlds where you can escape to build treehouses and tunnels in Minecraft. Instead, they will control your home, your transit, and even your body. Once you accept that the thing our ancestors called the information superhighway will actually be controlling cars on real-life highways, you start to appreciate the sea change we're witnessing. Well, I guess if Tesla and the other companies that are lobbying for self-driving cars have anything to do with it, then yes, that will be eventually true. But let's hope not. I trust people to drive more than computers. The internet isn't that thing in there, inside your little glowing box. It's in your washing machine, kitchen appliances, pet feeder, your internal organs, your car, your streets, the very walls of your house. You use your wearable to interface with the world out there. It makes perfect sense that a company like Tesla could be at the heart of the new infrastructure age. Musk's focus has always been relentlessly about remolding the physical world, changing the way we power our transit, and with SpaceX, where future generations might live beyond Earth. The opposite of cyberspace is physical space, and that is where Tesla is taking us. Hold on now, I feel like this is going a step too far. This writer is definitely praising Tesla, all hail Tesla. But Tesla cannot take full credit for these things. Because, yes, I'm sure Elon Musk has a lot of money, but Elon Musk also has a lot of political sway. That's how he's bringing all of his ideas to fruition. It's not that they're actually making a profit, because they're not. And if Tesla were not around... If the development of our future weren't left to inefficient government agencies, there would be better companies out there that would be making more innovative solutions. In the infrastructure age, however, physical space has been irrevocably transformed by cyberspace. Now we use computers to experience the world in ways we never could before computer networks and data analysis. 
using distributed sensor devices over fault lines to give people early warnings about earthquakes that are rippling beneath the ground, and using satellites like NASA's SMAP to predict droughts years before they happen. Of course, there are inevitable dangers that come with infusing physical space with all the vulnerabilities of cyberspace. People may hack your house. They'll inject malicious code into delivery drones. Stealing your phone might become the same thing as stealing your car. We'll still be mining unsustainably to support our glorious batteries and photovoltaics and smart dance clubs, but we will also benefit enormously from personalizing the energy grid, creating a battery-powered Earth for every home. Plus, the infrastructure age leads directly into outer space, to tackle big problems of human survival, and diverts our impoverished attention spans from gazing neurotically at the social scene unfolding into tiny glowing rectangles on our wrist. The author does have a good point here: the infrastructure age will take us into space. We'll go there so that we can mine for our precious metals. And battery materials. Also, if humans survive that long, we'll need more room because the world will just be overflowing with people. It's predicted that in thirty years the world population will reach almost ten billion, which, by the way, is projected to be the upper limit for the population that this world, this Earth that we live on, can sustain. The information age brought us together. For better or worse, it allowed us to understand our environments and our bodies in ways that we never could before. But the infrastructure age is what will prevent us from killing ourselves as we grow into a truly global civilization. That is far more important and exciting than any watch could ever be. So. Besides all of the bullcrap about Elon Musk and Tesla,、um, I think this author has a bit of truth in her story. The information age has existed for quite a while. The World Wide Web, personalized cell phones and computers—it's all been there for a couple decades now, and we've all had time to adapt to it. We've all learned how to use it exceedingly well. It's become part of our Daily lives. It's necessary for us to understand the world around us and to understand the other people around us. I mean, I've had to look up two words on Urban Dictionary this week alone. The thing is, though, there is evidence as of now for small incremental steps being taken to this infrastructure age that she's referring to. Look at the car industry, for example. There are no small startup car companies unless they're run by people who have millions and millions of dollars to spend on it. Most cars are produced by these massive, massive companies. They have billions of dollars in capital because they need to, because there's an infrastructure made not only of competing car companies but also of legalese. Of things that you need to go through before you can produce a car, you have to get approval from all sorts of government agencies. You have to pay fees and fines. You have to go through crash testing standards. You have to abide by all sorts of emissions regulations, which we know now, based on Volkswagen's trouble with it, is not that easy. I mean, the process for creating a new car costs so much that nobody can really do it. You have to have the infrastructure in place. But if you are one of those lucky companies that already has your infrastructure all set, you can just start spitting out products left and right. You can provide the entire world with your product and beyond. And that is what she's referencing here: is the ladder being kicked away and the success of one enterprise just exploding? Now it sounds a little scary and evil, but I don't think that it's all bad. I mean, yes, obviously, if you have a company that is part of an oligopoly, then you've probably done some things that are morally questionable. You've agreed to make payouts or 
you've agreed to abide by rules that you don't necessarily want to or agree with. Maybe you've used government force to make competition impossible for other companies. The thing is, however, I see that there could be great potential for massively life-altering creations coming out of these companies. And not just for individuals, but literally for the entire human civilization. We could see the infrastructure of our world changing and evolving now. Perhaps that is what the information age has led us up to. And now we are going to watch as car companies develop autonomous vehicles. Stations are built in space, on the moon, on Mars, asteroids, and beyond. Perhaps we will have a virtual reality practically built into our physical reality. Who knows, the possibilities are too numerous to count. All I know is that the information age has led us through a wonderfully uproarious change. And now we're going to see the conclusion of it if we haven't already. And what lies beyond? Futuristic technology that we can only dream of now. But someday, it will become realized. Space factories. Terraforming. Robot servants. Maybe eventually we'll be able to walk around the internet like it was a mall. What are your thoughts on this? Email me at IlluminationHour at gmail.com Thanks for listening, everyone. Hope to see you next week.